Uh, okay, uh, to, for Sensible BC, uh, Mr. Larson. Well, thank you very much. I'll, I'll take my full 10 minutes. Uh, uh, thanks for having me at this committee. I've been a cannabis activist uh, for all of my adult life. I, I run a cannabis dispensary, and I probably sold more cannabis than all the other witnesses combined. And um, it's, it's good to be here today, but I have to say that I have my doubts that this committee will actually act upon the evidence that is being brought before them and the testimony they're hearing. And I say that because I've been at this a long time, and when I first got started as a cannabis activist in the 1990s, the government was introducing the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act to replace the Narcotic Control Act. And at that time, there was a great deal of testimony and hearings, and about two dozen groups came forward, and all of them said that prohibition was a failure, the war on drugs was a failure, we should legalize and prohibition approach things differently. The only group that supported that legislation was the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police and the Canadian Pharmaceutical Association. Everyone else was against it. The government said we're going to pass this law and then we'll have a drug policy review afterwards. Well, that review never happened. Canada Senate took it upon themselves and they issued a comprehensive and detailed report on cannabis, that five-volume report that remains probably one of the best analysis of cannabis and cannabis policy today in 2002. That report was also completely ignored and I would in fact encourage committee members to take a look at that Senate report from 2002 because it is an incredible document and they recommended legalization of cannabis for all Canadians over the age of 16. These were conservative senators not not a bunch of uh, pot smokers and they recommended legalization for everyone over age, the age of 16 that was ignored. The year I was born 1971 the Ladane Commission recommended decriminalizing cannabis possession and cultivation and working towards legalization and that was also ignored. So for all of my life I've seen our government listen to testimony, issue, do, do research, have studies, talk to people, and then ignore the results. And I hope that doesn't happen here today. The Cannabis Act is a bad piece of legislation. It is flawed in a great many ways. It doesn't even decriminalize the joint that I have in my pocket now that I'm going to smoke after this committee hearing. The idea that we're going to have licit and illicit cannabis and that we're going to have the police trying to decide which cannabis is good and which cannabis is not good is simply not going to work. In cities like Vancouver, where that's already effectively decriminalized, we're not going to see much of a change in policy. But in, in northern areas where or First Nations communities or the poor people that are demonized and affected most by cannabis prohibition. You can bet police will be going after them. Where'd you get that cannabis from? That, that's illicit cannabis. We're going to charge you with possession. It is absurd at a time when we're talking about decriminalizing all drugs that we're still not even decriminalizing cannabis possession under this legislation. Now, I was asked to speak today about edibles, but to me, that's a category that, that's really too restrictive. We should be also discussing hashish, tinctures, capsules, extracts, creams, drops, suppositories, all the many ways that you can use cannabis. At my dispensary, we sell buds and we sell all these other products, and the buds that we sell is less than half of everything that we sell. So when I hear in Ontario, they're saying they're going to set up these legal shops right next to the dispensaries to put them out of business, I think, great, it's not going to affect my clients at all. Nine 95% of my customers will continue to shop with me, even if there's a legal shop next door. It's simply not going to have the range of products that are really available and necessary. So as an activist who wants to see better drug laws in Canada, I don't like this at all. But as a business owner, it's great. This is going to keep me and other dispensaries in business for many, many years to come. This will do nothing to shut down dispensaries or affect the black market at all. And, you know, we had a pretty major court case, the Owen Smith case. Uh, Kirk Tussaud, who spoke yesterday, was the lead lawyer on that case. And the courts ruled that medical patients have a right to access not only smokable buds, but cannabis and all these other forms as extracts. Health Canada's response was to allow licensed producers to make cannabis extracts with no more than 3% THC, which is a complete uh, disregard of both the, the letter and the spirit of that court decision. But it's not surprising because that's been the attitude of the government and Health Canada for years. Every time we get a court ruling against to expand the, the cannabis access, the government and Health Canada takes the most restrictive possible interpretation of that decision. And the result of this is that the government has lost control over cannabis, and they've lost control for many years now. We've been systematically dismantling Canada's cannabis laws for the last 20 years, beginning with the laws against bongs and vaporizers and pipes, which are still on the books under Section 462.2. That law has never been removed, and yet it'd be hard to find a city that doesn't have multiple bong shops in it today. And we did that in the 1990s by simply defying the law, opening up bong shops. There was raids and conflict, kind of like now with dispensaries, but after time, 
police and communities realized that the war on bongs was a failure, that nobody wanted to see it happen, and they gave up. And as a result, we've effectively legalized bongs and pipes, seed banks, vapor lounges, and we're on the way to doing it with dispensaries and well, and in many cities we already have. So we're not going to follow these laws, and you're creating laws that are simply unenforceable and cannot be, be you're giving the police an impossible task to do with large aspects of this legislation. I'm currently facing charges for giving away cannabis seeds. I've given away over 7 million viable cannabis seeds over the last two years. I traveled to 22 cities across Canada the last two years giving away seeds. And it was charged in Calgary in 2016 for giving away cannabis seeds. They've set aside a three-day trial for me at the end of October. Three days in court in our justice system that is letting alleged murderers and rapists go because they don't have space in our courts, but they're going to make three days for me for a trial for giving away low THC cannabis seeds to those who want them. I believe those charges will be dropped before they go to trial because what a waste of time that would be. But the fact is our courts cannot handle this massive civil disobedience campaign that Canadians have been launching and it's simply, simply not going to succeed. And I would like to remind the committee that the origins of Canada's cannabis prohibition on our drug war is not some well-intentioned effort to protect public health or to protect children or any of that. Our war on drugs, the war on opium, and the war on cannabis began as a racist and ignorant effort to eliminate Chinese people and other uh, racial communities from Canada. That's how it started. There's no question about that. And there's no time since 1908 when the Opium Act was passed or when cannabis prohibition came in the 20s and today when these laws changed from being racist and ignorant and to being somehow well-intentioned and good for our communities. These laws are bad in their origins and they continue to be terrible today. The fact is that the war on drugs is really a war on plants. And cannabis may just be the world's greatest plant. There's no other plant that has the nutritional, industrial, social, and medicinal value that cannabis does. But the other, the other aspects of this war on drugs and the war on plants are the fact that coca leaf, opium poppy, psilocybe mushroom, peyote cactus, these are all also good plants with thousands of years of social and, and cultural use. And the war on drugs is really a war against these plants and against nature, and it's time that it comes to an end. You want to know who to blame for the fentanyl crisis that we're experiencing across Canada? It's you. It's our parliament that has passed these laws that prohibits reasonable access to opiates. The fentanyl crisis is entirely the fault of Canadian policy. We don't have a drug problem in Canada. We have a prohibition problem in Canada. And when we end prohibition, we will see the vast majority of the problems we associate with drug use go away. Cannabis, in fact, is not a problem. Cannabis is part of the solution. In Vancouver, we now have two sites that are offering free or discounted cannabis medicines to opiate users as a substitution project. And there's evidence out of the U.S. showing that American states that have access to dispensaries have less opiate use and less opiate overdose deaths than those who do not. So I believe, from my personal experience and from the research, that cannabis dispensaries are saving lives every day in Canada. I know that my dispensary, people tell me, you help me get off opiates, you help me improve my health. You helped save my life. This happens all the time. With alcohol also, a lot of cannabis people find when they're using alcohol, al alcohol, they can get off alcohol by using cannabis. Cannabis is a substitution for more dangerous drugs in so many ways. It's easy to regulate edibles and extracts, give them childproof packaging, make sure that the products are uh, properly labeled and the dosages are correct. That's easy to do. It's not complicated at all. And further, CBD should really be descheduled entirely and removed from the CDSA. CBD is highly beneficial. There's no psychoactivity at all. It's an incredibly safe medicine. And there's no question that CBD should be removed from the CDSA and allowed entirely. But uh, the fact is, we can buy enough alcohol, tobacco, or even aspirin. Without aspirin, you can buy without any age limit at a corner store, and one bottle of aspirin can kill you. So the idea that we're treating cannabis so severely and so restrictedly when other more dangerous substances are allowed makes no sense at all, and it really shows the, the, the failure of this legislation. So I would urge this committee to go beyond cannabis, to accept that cannabis is a good plant and that prohibition is wrong, to stop handing over this industry to the black black market as you've been doing for so many decades, and to recognize that it's not just cannabis, that the whole war on drugs is an absolute failure, and it's time to legalize and regulate and put policies in place that are based on the science. We've had this research for 40 years or more now. We know that the war on drugs is a failure. We know that cannabis is essentially harmless and certainly less harmful than the alcohol or tobacco that is used uh, every day. So that's what I have to say. Thanks for having me here, and I hope that uh, this committee will listen to the evidence presented and make some serious changes to this legislation. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your enthusiasm. <laughs> Mr. Larson, um, you sell products. Now, by the way, when we talk edibles, again, I, I think we're talking, all I hear is brownies and gummy bears and whatever. You described a number of a range of products um, that this C45 would retain, uh, would still be illegal. You said, mentioned creams, sprays, tinctures, patches, tablets. These are all forms of cannabis that C45 would 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 continue to remain illegal. Um, can you tell us, in terms of the products that you sell, um, are these products unsafe? Are you finding, um, or do consumers want them? Um, what percentage of, of your users prefer these products as opposed to smoking cannabis? It's probably about 60-40, non like the extracts towards over uh, uh, buds. Uh, of course, there's also smokable extracts as well, hash and shatter and things like that that are also very beneficial but are used in a smoke format. But I think people are more inclined to use edibles and, and, and that when they know it's a safe amount. People do not want to ingest vast amounts of THC and hallucinate. That's not what they're looking for, right? That's why people tend to smoke is because it's easily titrated. You have the amount what you need, and then you're done. And with edibles, it can be a long wait. But edibles can be very useful for pain relief and for, for uh, uh, long-term, uh, longer effects, especially medical users who don't want to be smoking constantly. They find the right dosage with an edible or a suppository, by the way, which is an incredible uh, way of using cannabis, very low psychoactivity, good to get a high dose medicinally or otherwise. And, uh, and when they talk about legalizing, oh, we're going to sell it in liquor stores. Think you're going to sell suppositories and cannabis suppositories in liquor stores? We sell a cannabis cream called MJ Creams. There's no psychoactivity at all. You rub this cream on your skin skin is great for psoriasis and eczema, great for topical pain relief. This could be put on a baby or on anybody of any age. I don't see any reason to have an age limit on a cannabis-infused cream that has no psychoactivity. And so I think we've got to broaden the range of things that we're looking at. And at our dispensary, it is very rare for somebody to come back and say, I took too much of the edible and I had a bad experience. We tell people, like doctors do with prescription drugs, start off with a lower dose. If that doesn't work, work your way up to a higher dose, try a little bit more at a time until you reach the point where you're getting the effect that you want, and then you've got enough. And, uh, and, and if, if the government's not going to allow edibles and extracts, we're going to continue to sell them through dispensaries, through the black market. They'll be unregulated, but we do our best to make sure these products are safe and labeled, and given the constraints of legality, we do our best. And I think we do a pretty good job already, and a lot of the fear-mongering around edibles and extracts simply hasn't materialized in Vancouver or Toronto or other cities that have dozens and dozens of dispensaries we're not really seeing a lot of problems coming out of this, and that's an unregulated, self-regulated market. If we have some proper rules in place, problems will be minimal. I think Mr. Ayub put it well. He talked about uh, we want to we want to uh, limit the, the the use in uncontrolled fashion of products of unknown providence. And I, I think, um, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Bandry, you, you referred to it as a crapshoot. I mean, uh, would we prefer to keep this legal and have Canadians cooking their own edibles in their own kitchen? Uh, I mean, without any control over the concentration of the THC, for instance, in a, in a tray of brownies. Like, I, I don't, I fail to understand how that's a preferable public policy approach to edibles than putting it into the hands of tight regula uh, tightly regulated market and sold in, a, in retail fashion by people who can be advising the customers, as you just point out. People are going to make their own edibles anyways, even in a fully legalized market. People enjoy making their own edibles. It's fun. It's like growing your own cannabis. It's an enjoyable activity to grow a plant in your garden, then harvest it and use it. People like that. Tomatoes or zucchini or cannabis, people enjoy that. And people are going to make their own edibles even under legalization. Most won't. They'll go buy it in a store because that's easier. But people brew their own wine. They make their own beer. And there's no somebody coming in saying, we're going to check the alcohol level of that beer and make sure it's at the right level. That doesn't happen. Uh, and so I think a lot of these these concerns are overblown, but I would prefer to see a legally regulated market that's open and accessible for, for regular Canadians to enter, like it is with other products. Uh, but until that day happens, edibles will continue to be available, extracts will continue to be available. We sell pure CBD tincture and pure pure isolate of THC and CBD at dispensaries. We're, we're years and years ahead of where the legal system is going to be, and uh, you got a lot of catching up to do. Um, C45 legalizes dry flour and oil, but I'm not quite sure what that oil will be used for. So what's your understanding, Mr. Larson, of the oil that will be legal under this bill? Will it, how will people use it, and can it be vaped? 
Uh, my understanding is this legislation is only uh, it's 3% THC is the limit that licensed producers are able to make for their extracts, and I think this is the same thing. So I, I think there is, is going to be uh, a lot of problems with this. Uh, vaping is, is very positive, too, by the way. If you have concerns with people smoking, and those concerns are often overblown, but vaporizing eliminates most of those concerns. There's no particulates. It's purely uh, uh, just the active ingredients steamed off the plant. You inhale them. It's, it's, it combines the benefits of smoking, which is a quick action and being able to get your dosage precise uh, uh, without having any smoke involved. So I think vaping should actually be encouraged and be considered a better way of using it. And I really feel that under real legalization, which would mean that Canadian farmers are able to grow high THC cannabis by the thousands of hectares, that is what we're working towards. And when that comes, smoking buds will be less popular, but you'll be able to make extracts of pure THC or CBD or CBG or CBN or the other cannabinoids in any combination you want and vaporize or use those in a way that I think will be revolutionary and much, much safer than what we're doing now. Thank you. Is it, can I, is it possible that people are, are just more comfortable going to a hospital and saying they use cannabis when it's legal than it was beforehand? That maybe there's not an increase in actual overdoses, but simply, or like people taking too much, but simply an increase in people who are then going to go to a hospital and talk about it, whereas beforehand they could be criminally charged if they say I was using cannabis or somebody. Is that, is that a possibility or something that you've looked at? Uh, is it okay to... Sorry, I just no, thought no, I'd isn't the t time toss time something time. in there, but... Time's up. Mr. Chair, and again, a great panel. Thank you all for being here. Um, I wanted to get right to my questions because uh, we did... We do know that this is rolling out in 288 days. There's not a lot of time, and I, I think it's a really missed opportunity. We had Colorado here earlier uh, saying that really before you get this rolled out, you should be having your public education program in place, really good factual information. We don't see that there. Data collection uh, should be in place, treatment research, things along the lines. And uh, for the last two years, really, the Liberal government hasn't really been doing anything. And um, again, we're jamming all this into one week. And I just want to particularly thank Mr. Larson for being here. I think you're the first person we've had that's on the ground actually um, integrating and talking to the public about this very important issue and transformative piece of uh, legislation anyway. So I'm going to throw out all my questions and I'm going to throw them out all to you because I only have five minutes and I've got I think four main questions I'd like you to answer. Uh, first of all, uh, there's a lot of questions about cannabis by parents, um, educators. What do you do for your clientele um, for education and uh, when they have questions for you, do you have scientific basic pamphlets, things along those lines. Where do you get your product? Um, how do you assure quality control? And I'm curious, what would you say an, a good age cutoff would be? And I'm not talking for medicinal use, I'm talking just for recreational use. So those are four questions. I probably only have four minutes left for my time. Would you be able to comment on those four questions? Sure. Can you give them to me one at a time again so I don't forget all the questions? First of all, what do you do for your clientele as far as education is concerned? Okay, I'll just take it. So that, for that one, uh, it depends what they're coming in for, you know, but if we try to guide them to the right product, sometimes people come in, they're experienced with cannabis, they've used it a lot, they're just looking for a particular product, they don't need a lot of guidance. We also get senior citizens who come in, say, I haven't used cannabis in 50 years, my grandson says it'll be good for my arthritis or something. We don't typically stick a joint in their face. We normally give them uh, uh, edible products or CBD-based products or creams or tinctures or things that are going to have less psychoactivity and more of a medicinal effect. So we try to guide them based on what they're looking for and what their experience is. And like other things, we always tell them, start off with a small dose and then work your way up until you get to the point where you're getting the benefits or, or whatever it is that you're seeking. So that's the kind of guidance we try to give. It's like written type of uh, guidance? Uh, mostly or we have, we have some written information and pamphlets and things like that too. It depends. But a lot of it's just personal conversations with people and a one-on-one -on -one discussion. Like you'd have with a pharmacist or a doctor looking for guidance on cannabis. Sometimes they have a, a doctor's advice going in, but Canadian doctors don't really know a lot about can cannabis or the endocannabinoid system, which is you know part of our body system that the cannabis interacts with. So, so mostly it's... have training? 
Uh, yeah, we try to give them training. It, it varies, but uh, we make sure we talk to everybody. And if they can't answer the question, we make sure we have somebody there who can. Okay. Second question, where do you get your product? It's from the illegal market. By definition, we have no choice. There's no legal place for us to get it. Some of them are people that have been growing cannabis for years. Some of them are licensed under the medical program to grow their own cannabis, and they might have some extra that they, uh, uh, Health Canada wants you to destroy it or, or dis dispose of it if you have too much. Well, they dispose of it by selling it to a dispensary. There are many people that make edibles and extracts and things at home, and a lot of them don't meet our standards. The majority of what gets brought to us, we reject because it's not the right quality or it's not, doesn't meet our needs. Uh, but, uh, but it comes from the black market by definition, uh, but we do our best to make that the lightest shade of gray it can possibly be. That, two more questions. Uh, again, you, you were talking, you reject a lot of it. What do you do for quality control? And then a really important question, um, I'd like your opinion on uh, age okay for recreational use what do you think a cutoff age would be sure well for quality control it's a challenge because we're not able to access health canada certified labs they will test our cannabis if we have someone who's legally allowed to possess send it in but if i put on my website this lab tested our cannabis and here's the results health canada will call that lab and say you're going to lose your license you can't test can't dispensary cannabis so i can put out whatever results i want but only i know if i'm telling the truth or not i can't tell you which lab did the results and so that leaves us in a very difficult position. We also do our own study. The first thing we do when we get raw buds into our dispensary is look at them under a microscope. And I would encourage members to do the same thing. You can see a lot in terms of mold, mildew, the quality of the trichomes, the resinous glands, if they're there, if they're ripe. That's just the first step. If it, if it most of it doesn't pass that, then we will do a taste test on it. Someone will smoke a little bit of it. You can tell if there's chemical contaminants, if it's been over fertilized. Then we'll send it to a lab if we can. And then after that, if it meets all the standards, we'll put it on our shelves. Um, and with edibles and other products, we've actually found with edibles, we typically supply our producers with our cannabis or with an extract. So we know they're getting a standardized amount. We know where it comes from, and we can give them the same strain or a very similar product to help them standardize what they're making. And a lot of edible makers don't use raw buds. They will use an extract so they can make something of a known potency and then put that into their product, helping them to standardize the dosages. As to age limits, if I was in charge of the world, I'd make it 16 years old to buy cannabis from a legal place. That being said, I'm happy with the limit being the same as alcohol. That's not a problem. But one thing I see lacking in this legislation is there's no allowance for a parent to give cannabis to their child. You can give alcohol to your children at pretty much any age. A lot of young kids have a half glass of wine with dinner. We don't criminalize those parents. But if that parent were to give their children cannabis or share a joint with their 17-year-old child or something, they, they could be criminalized and face some serious repercussions. So that, I think, is an issue. To me, the use, the use of cannabis by youth is a family issue and should be determined at the family level. Level, and this legislation doesn't allow for any sort of family decisions on that, which I think is really a big problem. Great help. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the questions. So just quickly, would, would you recommend, one by all three of you, would you recommend Ontario, sorry, Canada include edibles in their allowable, or would you support the slower pace that's been proposed in the legislation? Just if you want each to address it, Mr. Larson. I support adding edibles and also other extracts as well, hashish and, and, and all those kind of things, both smokable and edible. It, that's got to be part of legalization. You're really only allowing the, the, the buds is, is missing out on a large portion of this. And, and uh, yeah, so I absolutely think this should be included. And I, I don't, this go slow thing, we've been going slow since 1971. It's time to act and not to, not to uh, go slow. Okay. Mr. Vigil? I don't know where BC is going to go with their distribution decisions, uh, whether it's dispensaries or LCBO. I don't even know if they have a liquor control board in BC or not. But uh, you've, you've heard where they're going here in Ontario, um, and they've all already uh, started to shut down some dispensaries and arrest the individuals in, inside. And uh, it's occurred in, in your environment as well, and I, I'm, I'm certain. Um, if the BC government determines that you cannot do this, you uh, indicate that you will continue to uh, to uh, have customers shop with you anyways, and um, I I just question that uh, you will not be able to allow. Like, I don't know. Do you have a storefront right now? I have no idea about dispensaries, Mr. Larson, because I've never been in one, and perhaps I'll come and visit yours just to learn some more about it, but I just don't know how you will continue to operate if uh, your government in B.C. decides to have it in a more controlled environment. 
Well, an interesting point. You know, let's make it clear. They are trying their hardest in Ontario to get rid of dispensaries already. They've been trying for a while, and they are failing miserably. And there are dispensaries in every major city in Canada, and most minor ones now, just like bong shops. And I told you, bongs are illegal too. And we fought, we got raided, people went to jail over bongs big time in the, in the 1990s. The problem that you have enforcing these laws is that the courts are not willing to give us severe penalties, and we have an overburdened justice system. They laid th hundreds of charges, or dozens of charges charges in Toronto, and they've only kept a handful of them. The, on the cannabis culture raid, when they went after Mark and Jody Emery and a few others, mm -hmm. not a single one of their suppliers was arrested or charged. They're selling cannabis from many companies who have labeling, websites, phone numbers, you can call them, people sell extracts. They could easily, if they wanted to spend the time and effort, go after these people. Then they're not, because the police and our justice system are not able to handle this kind of mass civil disobedience campaign that we're engaging in. We are, we like the phrase, overgrowing the government. There's too many of us willing to go to the to the to the end on this mm -hmm. that you can't keep up. And do you really want to put me in jail for selling cannabis? Is that where you think I belong? Because I'm going to keep doing it, and and that's going to be the only option. I'm going to keep giving away seeds. I'm going to keep using cannabis. Do you charge People, tax on your products? GST, PST? Some dispensaries do, some don't. We don't right now, but we're on the transitioning towards that. And um, I would be happy to do that. And you know, we're happy to follow reasonable regulations. I'm not an anarchist who does that want to follow the rules, but if the rules are saying I can't operate and I can't exist, then of course we're gonna we're gonna break those rules. Mm -hmm. uh, paying taxes? Do you file? Oh yeah, well, we file taxes. All of our staff are, are registered. We, we do all the deductions and all those kind of things as best we can. I can't speak for every dispensary. There are hundreds across Canada. Some uh, operate in many different ways than others, but. You can't stop us. You don't have the capability in the policing and the courts to deal with what we're doing. That's why it's been so successful, and we're going to keep doing that. So the rules have to put, take that into consideration, that there is already a vibrant and dynamic cannabis industry, and we are committed to what we're doing, and that that needs to be incorporated into legalization, or else you've got to find a way to compete with us and produce better products at a lower price with a higher selection and higher quality. If you do that, we'll go out of business, and I would consider that a victory on my end. If my dispensary can't operate because there's better, cheaper, higher quality cannabis available from a legal source, then I won. I don't need to run a dispensary. I just want cannabis to be legal and available, and so that, that's how I see it. But until that day comes, as long as my dispensary can provide products that aren't legally available, that people want to get, we'll keep doing it. To being uh, down the list so that a lot of the questions I thought of have been asked. Uh, Mr. Larson, um, I think we've heard lots of evidence about the damage criminalization has done to Canadians and many of the harms associated with cannabis are, I think, directly related to the criminalization of cannabis, not cannabis itself. Now, C45, I think we all would acknowledge, makes progress. Um, but it retains a criminalized approach. You know, there's it's criminally, uh, criminal sanctions for possession over 30 grams, criminal sanctions for growing over four plants over 100 centimeters, criminal sanctions over selling punishable by penalties up to 14 years. If criminalization has failed and caused harm, um, won't C45 continue to do that at least to some degree? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, it's got more criminalization in this bill than we have already in some areas. Uh, and that 14-year penalty also means there's no conditional discharges available as well, which I think is a big concern. And, you know, speaking as a member of the cannabis movement, we don't really need the government's help in getting high-quality cannabis products. We just want the government to stop arresting people. And that really should be the focus of this legislation. It's, it's shameful to me that we haven't decriminalized cannabis possession already, and this, has, this wasn't a big priority and hasn't happened yet, but that is the flaw in this legislation. And it's treating cannabis much more severely than alcohol is treated. And yet, by any measure, cannabis is safer than alcohol. And I think that everybody that's testified would, would agree with that idea. And so if we're going to restrict cannabis more than alcohol, that's driving people towards alcohol. If we're going to restrict cannabis advertising and packaging and all these things more than alcohol is, that means we're saying we want people to drink alcohol instead of using cannabis. And I think it should be the other way around. And the idea that we've made mistakes with alcohol and it's too available, so we're going to tighten up with cannabis, that's absolutely backwards. Uh, cannabis is safer and should be treated like that. And to continue to criminalize people because of the cannabis they have on them or any of this is, is the wrong way to go entirely. Okay, thank you.
uh, that completes our normal round of questioning. And uh, so, unless there's any inquiry, or yeah, did you want to inquire? Uh, yes, Chair, I'd like to move unanimous consent to have another round because we have about half an hour left. Mm -hmm. Okay, do we have unanimous consent for another round? Yes. We have unanimous consent. Okay, um, Mr. McKinnon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Larson, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to find a low-hanging fruit, if you will, about edibles. Um, so in your shop and in your experience with other shops, what are the, uh, what do people want? What are the most popular products? So perhaps your top three uh, sellers. It really depends on what they're looking for, you know. Some people just want to feel good and get high, and some people have a medicinal need, or they've got pain, or they've got cancer, or systemic ailment, and they need a different kind of treatment. So it really depends. But edibles are less used recreationally because, because of the fact they can be stronger, and because of the difficulty of titrating the dose, most people that I know that use cannabis smoke it primarily. Edibles and extract, and also we use extracts as well, something that I keep trying to bring up that isn't part of this conversation. Things like shatter or hash or other forms of inhalable cannabis that are, that are made, those are also very popular as well. And they allow you to smoke less cannabis to get the same effect. If we're concerned about smoking, you have one hit off one thing or you gotta smoke a whole bunch of something else, Probably the stronger one is the safer one in that regard. We're trying to talk about edibles here. I mean, right. Okay. Why, so, so with edibles, I mean, so the question is, what do people seek, or why are they taking edibles? No. I. I what are the most popular? Most what popular are edibles are things that taste good. People like treats. They don't really don't want to take capsules or, or things if they can have something that's yummy. We definitely sell things that that are that are that are more delicious, more than things that are less tasty. Absolutely. Uh, and that's so just we, human we, we human nature. Really come up with a legislation that says, well, let's 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 regulate treats. We need something a little more specific, if, if you can. You can put cannabis into all kinds of uh, kinds of food products, right? Some people feel like to buy infused butter so they can add it to their own food and put it on toast or put it into foods Do you themselves. Sell a lot of infused butter. Uh, yeah, we sell infused butter, we sell infused oils, uh, and we sell different kinds of edible products. Uh, we sell savory things as well, but normally they're kind of snacky type what, foods. What are your top sell? three sellers? Of Sorry, say that again? What are your top three products, edible products that you sell? Think about that a little bit. We sell some drops that are very popular. It's not really an edible, but it's a drop that's made with infused hemp seed oil. It's like an edible. I would say that cookies are incredibly popular, and people like different kinds of cookies. And we sell a fair amount of CBD products as well that have very low or no psychoactivity but have medicinal benefit. And CBD edibles are becoming more and more popular as well. Okay. Um, home grow. So one of the concerns with home grow personal cultivation, I guess, um, is potential for diversion to the illegal market. Uh, do you see that, that the regulations around you know, the limitations on number of plants and so forth, uh, well, firstly, are they necessary to prevent that diversion and uh, will they in fact prevent that diversion? Well, it depends what you mean by diversion. It's hard to sell the cannabis you're going to get from four one meter tall plants. You're not going to get that much. But certainly sharing it with your friends, I think that'll happen. And if you really want to stop people from diverting cannabis, make it cheap. The only reason people grow and sell cannabis is because it's very expensive and very profitable. When this plant is worth 5 to $10 a gram, it doesn't matter if it's legal or not. If I can grow a plant in my home that's worth $1,000 and then sell it, people are going to do that. The way to stop diversion and to get people to not be doing that is simply to make cannabis much more affordable, make the price lower to where it should be for a natural product. It's the only plant that we sell by the gram and not by the pound. Uh, and so I would like to see cannabis be a dollar a gram or something like that, which is still an incredibly high price for a bit, a little bit of plant matter, but that would eliminate the vast majority of diversion if there's no profit in it. But as long as if legal cannabis maintains the same price structure as illegal cannabis, then the illegal market will continue because that's just how it's going to be because of the profitability. And so that's the real question. But I think that most people growing four plants at home are going to grow it for themselves or to share with their friends and family, and they're not going to be selling it because the profit margin isn't that great. For just, for just for a few plants. You're going to want to have a bigger grow to, to really satisfy the underground market. And that, that's where most of the underground market will remain. So let's go back to packaging, if I have time. Um, so the, the, the edible products that you sell, uh, what's the packaging like? Are these like home-cooked home products 
or are they manufactured in some way? Uh, it's, it's sort of halfway between those things. You know, we strive for a professional product, but it's very difficult to access mainstream bakeries or places to make products if you're going to be making cannabis products. So as a result, we are forced into this kind of area where they're made at home or in a small scale. Uh, we use childproof packaging. We do our best to label our products with an accurate level of the cannabinoids that are in there, although that's a challenge, both simply because of the testing available and because dispensaries can't fully access that kind of testing. What do you think of? Okay. okay, now we go to uh, Dr. Carey. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'll be sharing my time with my colleague. But again, um, Mr. Larson, I'd like to direct the question to you. Um, again, thanks for being here. And obviously, you're very knowledgeable. Um, and I would think your input and your knowledge about how things are today in Canada on the ground is, is very important. And I'm curious. Has, as far as yourself or anybody involved in the production distribution field, was anyone you know uh, consulted in reference to the rollout <clears throat> of this as a public policy or the drafting of this bill? Was there any consultation done by the government with anybody uh, that you would know? No, you mean the task force that was initially put together and that kind of thing? Well, I wasn't, I mean, some yeah. people were, I wasn't invited to speak at that task force. Some of my allies or our friends will, but uh, I found that just sort of regular cannabis users aren't really in part of this discussion so much. Uh, I mean, I use cannabis every day. I used cannabis this morning before I came here, and I'm going to use some afterwards when we're done. Uh, and uh, and I think that voice is perhaps missing, the, the typical users. But, uh, but no, I haven't seen a lot of consultation among the cannabis cannabis community in that way. Very good. How much time do I have? 28 seconds. All right. Well, then I'll just end with a comment. And Mr. Larson, with all due respect, I find your um, your lack of respect for the rule of law in this country disturbing because it's clear that it doesn't matter what we come with in C45, you're going to do whatever you like and obey whichever laws you like. And I don't personally approve of that. Thank you. I in the time. Okay. That's uh, time's up. Now we go to Mr. Davies. Um, thank you. Um, Ms. Lewis, I want to thank you for being here. You're the only dispensary owner that we have heard from out of all those witnesses we heard this week. You're the only person uh, involved in the actual edible market who actually is familiar with the products on a on a day-to-day -day commercial basis. And, and I, I think it's very valuable to have your, your perspective here. Um, I guess my first question to you, Mr. Larson, is that if we don't legalize edibles, um, there will be no way to test the THC levels, the CBD levels, the, it's at all the other different compounds. So products will still be consumed by Canadians, it appears to me, who will have no real assurance of the content since, you, as you said, you can't send these products to accredited Health Canada labs to make sure that the products are what they say they are. Am I missing something there? No, that's all accurate. Okay. Um, now, um, in terms of, um, you, you mentioned the issue of, of uh, decriminalizing now. Um, have you faced any legal uh, charges or any pe people that are patronizing your store? Have they faced any criminal um, um, enforcement actions against them? And if not, how, how has the present criminalized environment affected you and the customers who come into your store? Well, Vancouver's had a more progressive attitude towards cannabis for quite a while, and so possession arrests are, are very, very rare in Vancouver compared to other jurisdictions. Uh, you'll be hearing from the Hillary Black, who started Vancouver's first dispensary. Uh, that was about 20 years ago. Uh, we opened ours in 2008. We were the third one in the city. Now there's quite a few. And um, for us in Vancouver, I, I've been breaking cannabis laws every day for pretty much all my life, and the first time I've ever been charged was for giving away low-THC cannabis seeds. In, in Calgary last year, uh, but uh, it really varies by, by jurisdiction, and what we enjoy in Vancouver is certainly not the same as the rest of the country. The further north you go in Canada, the rate of possession and trafficking charges increase drastically, and I believe that's largely because our First Nations population also increases drastically the further north you go. Uh, but uh, So it really varies across the country how these laws are enforced, which is another example of how it's, it's not just. I can do something in Vancouver, which I can get away with, uh, but someone in another part of the country does the same thing could find themselves in a very serious legal situation. Now we, we heard Mr. Weber uh, commented that he had never been in a dispensary and I yeah. think he's 
He's probably not alone on this committee. Um, I have the benefit of being in Vancouver where I've, I've had the ability to tour several dis, uh, dispensaries, including the Compassion Club and, and some licensed facilities. It, we as parliamentarians are studying this bill and uh, we have to make recommendations to this bill about all sorts of issues, but we have not toured dispensaries. We have not um, uh, toured licensed producer facilities, compassion clubs. Do you think that it would be helpful for the parliamentarians in this committee to actually get out in the community and, and tour some of these facilities um, in order to help us evaluate the, um, whether this bill is good as it is or whether it could be amended. I, I think that would be very worthwhile. And I think to get an understanding of what's really happening and of the limitations of the laws that you're trying to pass and the limitations of the ability to enforce the laws you're trying to pass, I think it would be very important to see what's actually happening at the grassroots level and also really to see the people that are benefiting from accessing dispensaries and how it improves their lives and how it, it, it benefits our local communities. Uh, there's also kinds of dispensaries. I'm not saying everyone is run perfectly by any means, but from what I see, people are glad to have dispensaries. They benefit them and they provide a lot of positive results. And, uh, and I think it would be very worthwhile to see what's actually happening at the grassroots level and how what people are doing and understand that the laws that you're passing, the current cannabis laws are already being ignored pretty much all across the country to varying degrees. If you're not going to take that into consideration when you pass these new laws, they're going to be a failure because we will continue to ignore these laws. And the courts will back us up on that. And you talk about the rule of law, and, and you know, some people would say that we have a moral obligation to break unjust laws. And then when laws are punishing people who do not deserve to be punished, when laws are based on racial bigotry and ignorance of how these laws were founded, that we have a moral duty to break those laws. And I personally am glad that I'm able to provide cannabis medicines to those who need it. I believe I am improving people's lives every day, and we will continue to do so. Um, some have suggested that uh, once this, leg this legislation is enforced and it legalizes simple possession and a few other, th other things, that um, we as a parliament should take steps to pardon those who have been convicted of crimes that this legislation will no longer uh, render a crime. What's your view on that? I think we should go further than that. I actually would like, if I was in charge, I would put GST on cannabis, and for the first two years, first few years, I put that money into a fund to make reparations to those Canadians who have been unjustly imprisoned or have their lives negatively affected by cannabis prohibition. And I really think that the legalization of cannabis should begin with an apology to the cannabis culture and to cannabis users for a hundred years of punishment and incarceration and harassment and, and demonization that was entirely undeserved. Not for me personally, but for the people in Canada who have suffered from this, I would like to see not only a pardon, but an apology and some kind of restitution made, because these laws have been unjust from the beginning, and they remain so today. And we've known this for decades, that these laws do not work, that they're a failure, and it's a real shame that people are still being arrested every single day. A guy spent three nights in jail recently for a couple of grams of cannabis in Canada. That should be shocking to the conscience of parliamentarians, that these laws are in place, putting people in prison for three, or jail for three days for a couple of grams and uh, and and you know they say the time of the greatest growth of cannabis use in Canada was in the 1960s at a time when it was a six month mandatory sentence for possession and a seven year mandatory minimum sentence for growing or importing any quantity of cannabis and that was the time of the highest increase of cannabis use in our country's history. The idea that these laws have an impact on people's behavior, that if you say we're, you can't smoke cannabis anymore, we're all going to stop, that's entirely backwards. Now we're living under mandatory minimums uh, that were passed by Stephen Harper in Canada. That hasn't stopped the proliferation of dispensaries at all. And so I think you need to acknowledge the, the limitations of what Parliament and the police can do in this kind of a situation and write laws, craft laws that acknowledge that and take that into consideration. I want to say that I walked down Spark Street the other night in a cloud of smoke, and I think if somebody had tested me, I would have tested positive by the time I got the end of the street. But thank you very much, and we'll suspend the meeting.